Good morning and welcome to the first installment of our new speaker series, Safe at Home at the Center for a New American Security. I'm Carrie Cordero. The Safe at Home series is intended to bring greater attention to the safety and security issues that affect Americans on a daily basis. Why? Well, one, because doing better on safety and security will make the country a better place to live. But two, from a national security perspective, it's because confidence in our system of government relies on making sure that democracy delivers. And one of the things that must deliver is security. Without it, citizens start looking around for leaders who might promise to bring law and order, but who might be willing to trample over the Constitution to do it. And so security, safety, and protecting our democracy go hand in hand. So in this series throughout the year, we will talk about the challenges to homeland security, such as international and domestic terrorism, political violence against government officials, pandemic preparedness and response, climate-related emergency management, and even mass shootings and drug trafficking, which are not usually part of the national security conversation. Based on the premise that strengthening US democracy requires in part doing a better job of delivering security and safety at home, this series is gonna dive deep into the efforts that policymakers, leaders, and operators at the federal level and all across the country are engaging in to protect the country consistent with our laws and values. To begin this series of discussions, I am delighted to welcome the Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security, John Tian. The country is so fortunate that John Tian is back in public service. He is an example of an exemplary servant leader. Those who watch CNAS events that I participate in know that usually I just give a title, but I want to introduce you in a little bit more detail to the Deputy Secretary. He has spent the last 10 years in senior executive roles in the critical infrastructure financial services industry, uh, functioning as a chief operating officer, similar to his new role at DHS. The deputy previously served in the Obama administration as the National Security Council Senior Director for Afghanistan and Pakistan, in the Bush administration as the National Security Council Director for Iraq, and in the Clinton administration as a White House Fellow in the Office of the United States Trade Representative. The deputy began his career of public service at the United States Military Academy at West Point. And for the next 24 years, he served as a US Army combat arms officer, retiring in 2011 at the rank of Colonel. He is a veteran of three combat tours to include serving as the Task Force 237 Armor Battalion Commander in Operation Iraqi Freedom. He has numerous military decorations, including the Bronze Star Medal with one Oak Leaf Cluster, the Combat Action badge and the Valorous Unit Award. As I mentioned, he graduated from West Point and was also a Rhodes Scholar. And so I'm delighted to welcome him into the conversation in just a few minutes. And we are honored to have him here with us today. A few notes uh, just logistically about our virtual conversation. This conversation is being carried live and being live streamed on CNAS's website, as well as our social media channels. On our website, you can enter questions for me and the deputy, and you can also post questions on Twitter using the hashtag CNAS2022. Our social media team will make sure that I see those questions, and I'll be looking to incorporate them throughout the conversation. So don't hold them till the very end. You can just feel free to enter them, and I'll keep on my eye on that box and uh, incorporate them into our conversation. So I'd like to get started, and uh, I'm, I'm going to ask a question of Deputy Secretary Tian in, in a moment. But to frame that question, I want to provide some background information and context and statistics about some matters that, uh, in my judgment, are the things that really are affecting Americans in their daily lives. So first, with respect to terrorism, there have been over 700 individuals who have been charged in connection with the January 6, 2021 insurrection on the Capitol, an act of domestic terrorism and political violence. On gun violence, something affecting communities very much, according to the Washington Post, there were 42 acts of gun violence in schools alone in 2021. The pandemic, I don't even need to give the numbers, everybody knows them. We have been suffered the tragedy of over 875 thousand lives lost to the coronavirus pandemic so far. There is no aspect of American life 
that is not affected, no uh, family that is not affected by the coronavirus pandemic. Natural disasters, according to NOAA data, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, in 2021, there were 20 weather and climate disasters, which is far more than the average over the course of the last 30 years. It has, those types of events in the last year killed over 680 people, and they cost billions and billions of dollars to repair them uh, after they occur. And finally, I mentioned drug overdoses, not normally something that's part of a CNAS discussion, but there has been, according to NIH data, a five-fold increase in the number of drug-related deaths in the past 20 years, from just under 20,000 in 1999 to over 90,000 in 2020. And deaths from fentanyl have, in particular, have skyrocketed in the past six years. So I, I want to bring Mr. Deputy Secretary, into the conversation now. I'm so honored to have him here. Given these really grim numbers uh, and a lot of challenges that we are seeing from a public safety perspective, from a homeland security perspective, from where you sit in your new role, how safe are Americans here at home? Thanks very much, Carrie. I appreciate uh, number one for CNAS and for you for hosting this forum inviting me to be your first guest in this really important uh, series called Save at Home. When we first got the invitation, I thought, well, this is directly where we're at within the Department of Homeland Security. It's our mission, it's our passion, and it's our way of being dedicated uh, to the American people, our homeland, and our values. You know, on all of the things that you just listed, and it was a litany of uh, really concerning items and certainly a, a pretty apt description of many threats. And I think you and I would both agree, not all of the threats, right, uh, that are out there, but I would agree there are many. And when I reflect on my 35 years plus in public service, and thank you very much for the uh, nice uh, introduction, my 35 years plus in the public service, you mentioned my time in the United States Army, but as well in the private sector, uh, in one of our, what we call here in DHS, critical infrastructure sectors, uh, there are 16 of them, and I was in the financial services infrastructure sector. Uh, it's remarkable. I'm telling you, it's remarkable how much the threat landscape has changed. And quite honestly, in my opinion, has grown certainly from the last over the last 20 years. And I would posit, I would posit has has become even more diverse and has become as we've seen a market increase from even three to four years ago. And I, I think the way you described it was apt, it was accurate. Uh, and uh, I'm just gonna name, I'm gonna sort of focus on a couple of them. Uh, you mentioned a few of them. And I know throughout this, we've got about 45 minutes. So we'll keep talking about threats. We'll keep talking about DHS. So I promise you, I won't walk down through the uh, org chart of DHS and speak about all of our components uh, in what all 240,000 of us do. Uh, but I do want to touch on a few of them, domestic violent extremism, cyber attacks, natural disasters. So to your to your second part of your your question, you know, how safe are Americans? Look, the first thing I'll say is uh, Americans always have been, in my opinion, uh, and now need to be even more so. And you were very much so. I was watching your face as you were describing all of these things. I've met you a few times. I've certainly read a lot of your uh, articles online and watch you in other forms. You are what I would call, and I think this is what Americans need to be in general, they need to be clear-eyed realists, clear-eyed realists, right? The world has changed, you know, and, and I think we agree. The threats are so diverse and there are so many of them. So you and I could sort of sit here uh, and on this, I would see some downswell of concerns and go, okay, so what do we do about it? Well, the good news, the good news that here at the Department of Homeland Security, I've got the crest behind me, I have the mission above me, all 240,000 of us are addressing these threats head on. And like I said, while I'd like to talk about all of my 240,000 DHS teammates, I won't do that, promise that. But let me mention a few of the things that we are doing to make Americans more safe at home. Like number one, uh, and it's been in the news a lot lately, I know you all talk about it, and I know you certainly speak about it, and that's what we're doing around cybersecurity. In particular, we've got an organization here. It's called the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Many people just refer to it in the acronym CISA. Uh, it is fully engaged 
in well integrated with the American private sector, as well as the obviously the uh, federal government and those who own in the private sector, the vast majority, the vast majority of our critical infrastructure, such as the financial networks, power grids, water supplies. And I would recommend to, and this is uh, you know a bit of a public service announcement, but I think it's important because you asked me, you know, how safe Americans should feel at home. I think one thing that they can do, in, or if you're listening to this and you have an organization, my strong recommendation to improve your cybersecurity resilience is I would point you to CISA's launch last year of the website. I just went to it this morning and it's stopransomware.gov. Stopransomware.gov, right? And we'll tell you sort of what is ransomware, what to do about it, uh, and how you can protect yourself against it. Super important. In terms of local community uh, security, I know we're going to talk about Coleyville here a little bit later. Uh, what we know here at DHS in terms of information, we share. We, we, you know, broadly titled information sharing, and we do, we share it with our partners at the state, at the local, tribal, and territorial levels, and as I was just mentioning before, with our private sector partners. As we often say here, and I know you've heard this before, I've read a lot of your material, so we're, I think we're pretty good and pretty consistent with this, Kerry. We are a department of partnerships here at the Department of Homeland Security. We have to be. We need to be. And that's how one way that we try to keep uh, Americans more safe. Now, again, I know we're going to get into some other aspects of what we do here at DHS, but I do, I do want to take this moment uh, and restate the mission very quickly that with honor and integrity, we will safeguard the American people, our homeland, and our values. And the reason I, I parse that out, right, people, homeland, values, is that that last clause is really important, that we will safeguard our values. And one way that we do that here is that we will carry out our DHS mission by always making sure we're consistent with privacy protections, civil rights, and civil liberties, and all the laws of the United States of America. So I, I always want to make that point because I think sometimes uh, we sort of get in there and we're always talking about doing safeguarding. And I would say that every one of us, as we're thinking through this, we're thinking about privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties of our fellow citizens. And certainly we are always going to follow the laws of our country. So look, in summary, and then we can get on to the, to the next set of questions that you want to talk about. We acknowledge here that we face a wide array of threats they are diverse, but that as a deputy secretary and as Secretary Mayorkas would certainly say as well, the American people can and should feel safer because of the actions that we here in the department are taking. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, I, I, let's drill down on a few things sure. that I know are uh, really top of mind to the country, um, and that's in the violent extremism uh, realm of things. I know you have a substantial background of, in counterterrorism activities from your military expensive experience. It's a different uh, role. It's a different, uh, an entire different enterprise when you're looking at activities that are happening here at home. So um, I want to ask you about the Colleyville hostage taking, which was uh, a hate crime and an act of international terrorism. Um, there was a Washington Post article that uh, came out right after the event and it right after the, the, uh, the hostage taking. And uh, it was the article itself, it was outlining steps that Jewish synagogues and institutions had taken since 2018, since the Tree of Life mass shooting in Pittsburgh. And it included this sentence, which uh, frankly drove me crazy. It said, only a few years ago, Jews could walk into synagogues without thinking about security. And I checked yesterday and they changed the article to actually say not long ago. But that still is not quite different. Now, I know, Mr. Deputy, from my own personal experience of attending services and community gatherings, that that statement is not true, that it's not something that we just started thinking about uh, a few years ago. And I know from my professional experience that the security community, including DHS, has been thinking about these issues and working on these issues and doing things about these issues for a really long time, particularly instigated by the post 9-11 era. Um, and so one example of that is the DHS FEMA nonprofit security grant program. Now that grant program started back in 2004. Efforts to develop it started uh, right after, a few months after 9-11. Uh, 
the amount of money that has been dedicated to this secure communities uh, grant program to help Jewish and other faith communities and nonprofit organizations that are potentially targets of terrorist and other hate based violence, the budget has increased substantially. So I checked and back in 2016, the grants were around 20 million. The fiscal year 2021, 2020, 2021 numbers are up to 180 million. So obviously an area where Congress and the department are devoting um, more resources. But can you, you know, looking at the Colleyville incident, grants being one area where DHS has a role to play, can you talk more about either the grants program and other initiatives that you have at the department that you and the secretary are working on um, to prevent and address future incidents like what we saw a couple weeks ago? Yep, absolutely. And uh, thanks for bringing up the grants program. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And, uh, and actually, it's forms like this where when we talk about the grant programs, you know, I think a lot of faith-based organizations, a lot of our communities out there know about them. Uh, but you know as well as I do, uh, it's a big country. And uh, these kind of forms sort of can get that word out there. So, A, appreciate uh, giving the grant program some exposure. You know, before I, I talk about the grant programs and I sort of step through all the different things uh, that we do here at DHS and I think really across the country, to make ourselves feel safer at home and how our work um, on behalf of faith-based organizations. I, I do want to salute a few folks here, re uh, reference in terms of the Colleyville situation. Um, look, for, for uh, a person, you obviously read off my, uh, bio, my, my bio, but you know we're all products of our experiences. You know, I served three combat tours as an army officer in Iraq, uh, and as well as deployed to, in a policy role to Afghanistan as well. I know what these situations can be like. I dealt with situations like this uh, when I was in Iraq. It's they're they're difficult, and I just want to say I salute the the four, the, certainly the rabbi uh, and the the other three individuals who were held hostage and were. And I, I said before, right? Uh, Americans need to be clear eyed, right? Uh, I really salute them for being clear eyed, not just uh, in the horrible moments when they were being held hostage. And when Rabbi uh, Citron Walker saw that opportunity where he handed the glass of water to, um, to the individual who was holding them hostage and realized that was the moment in time where they could uh, run and get out there and, and take that opportunity. But also when they were clear eyed, uh, when they realized, and you just mentioned it, that the unfortunate reality that we live in now and we have been for, for many years that they were, might someday be part of an active shooter scenario. Uh, and I really salute them for being thoughtful in that uh, spot. I salute my uh, fellow colleagues here in DHS and really all of those uh, in the law enforcement community, include the FBI, who's helped prepare folks to think about that uh, for, for all of us. I also salute those brave first responders and law enforcement who were on the scene quickly uh, or ready to step into the breach. Uh, in terms of what we do next or what we have been doing, uh, in terms of being clear-eyed, not just what happened in Colleyville, but being clear-eyed by the fact that anti-Semitism continues to be on the rise and the specter of really violent extremism is becoming a reality or has been a reality in our country uh, and abroad, we have to be prepared for that. You mentioned the Nonprofit Security Grant Program. Uh, we run that through FEMA. Uh, the, and you can, you know, for anybody who's listening here who maybe is in these communities or looking for uh, some uh, uh, training and some uh, things that you can do in order to make yourselves more secure, your communities more secure, your buildings more secure, really recommend that you go to, to our FEMA website and you take a look and you understand, you know, how do you apply uh, for these grants? What it does is it really helps them upgrade their security and will really help protect themselves against terrorism, hate crimes, and targeted violence. Uh, one of the other things that we're doing is we are trying to get left of the of these actions, right? So we want to be prepared. We want to be clear-eyed at the right time in the right way, uh, for sure. But one thing we'd like to do is to be left of the actions. So one of the things that we started here at DHS uh, in the last year is something called the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships. We call it CP3. And what this is really doing is expanding our ability to prevent terrorism and targeted violence throughout the development of local prevention frameworks. Again, it's trying to get left of these, these horrible 
uh, events, and we wanted to be in the prevention framework. And so we do this by leveraging, um, and remember, it's prevention programs and partnerships. One of the things that we're trying to do is leverage community-based partnerships to address the early risk factors and ensure individuals receive help before they actually radicalize uh, to violence. I'll, I'll close by saying we, we had a, um, the, as, as you recall, there were the tragic shootings in, in Atlanta, which is actually my current hometown, uh, right? That's where I came from when I was nominated here. Uh, in those tragic shootings in Atlanta, within the days afterwards, DHS, and I wasn't here then, so, uh, but obviously I know about it now, DHS formed something called the DHS uh, Asian American Native Hawaiian and Pacific uh, Islander Task Force. And, and we did this uh, to coordinate efforts across the DHS enterprise, not just the department, but the enterprise that combat domestic violent extremism and targeted violence against that particular community, the Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community. However, in September 2021, 20, which I had been here for about uh, two months at that point in time, the task force was broadened and renamed the DVE, Domestic Violent Extremism Equity Task Force, to respond to additional communities that are impacted by targeted violence and domestic violent extremism. Uh, so let me let me pause there and, and see where you want to go next, Carrie. Yeah, let me ask you a, a follow up question um, related to Colleyville, but but the department's role a little bit more generally. So you you describe the interest in getting left of attack. And so for those of us with the counterterrorism background, that's a very uh, uh, familiar construct, um, especially for those in our CNES um, audience and community that that have the counterterrorism background. Um, intelligence plays an obviously critical role in getting left of the attack or event. Um, one of the great things about our uh, CNES community here is those who uh, tune in and are watching. And so um, I want to recognize that we uh, we have a question that has come in from a former director of national intelligence, uh, Mr. Clapper. So uh, former DNI Clapper, thank you for joining us. And um, I want to ask, therefore, a question about intelligence. Um, DHS has a role in vetting individuals who come into the country, um, and it also has an Office of Intelligence for whom there is a nominee, Ken Weinstein, my former boss as Assistant <laughs> Attorney General for National Security at the Justice Department, mm -hmm. um, and he is the nominee for leading up the department's uh, intelligence and analysis section. Can you talk a little bit um, about the uh, both with respect to Colleyville and the fact that this was a foreign person who got into the United States and and paying attention to that, both from an intelligence perspective and from a vetting perspective, um, was a foundational piece of why the department was created. So can you talk a little bit about, um, with respect to Colleyville in particular, are there reviews being done as to where was the intel, where was the vetting process, and sure. how is the department and the intelligence community looking at that um, in terms of preventing a future such uh, recurrence? No, I appreciate that. Well, number one, uh, I'll, I'll first say um, we look forward to Ken going through the speedy confirmation process. Uh, you know, we can uh, hope that we can get that done over here over the next few weeks, but we, we're look, really looking forward, if confirmed, uh, Ken, Ken coming on board as the Undersecretary for Intelligence and Analysis here at Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and good to know that uh, you guys have a uh, prior relationship. So, so that's super. Um, let me on Colleyville in terms of the vetting. You know, look, first, I think it would be good to restate the facts here. So let's just level set. Uh, and then I'll get into your question, or I think I'll probably really end up addressing the question as we walk through it. First, remember the individual who came here and held people for people hostage to include Rabbi Citron Walker was a citizen of the United Kingdom who entered the United States under something that's called, and it's a, it's been a program that's been around for a long time, the visa waiver program. Now this is a long standing travel security program and it permits certain citizens or nationals of about 40 different partner countries to travel to the United States for business and for tourism purposes without a visa for up to 90 days. Now, when someone applies for this uh, for uh, v through the visa waiver program, DHS, along with several, several, I want to mention that. So it's it's the I, I would say 
uh, a good chunk, if not the vast majority, of the federal law enforcement intelligence agencies, federal law enforcement and intelligence agencies, vet the individual by reviewing various databases. Uh, and it is a multi-stage process, right? It's a multi-stage process and we're looking at various databases. So you put those two things together, you see it's a dynamic process and it's a comprehensive process. Now, you know, you would ask, it was like, well, how did it work this time? We tell you, we've, re we've gone through and we've reviewed and we're still reviewing. Mm -hmm. The way it worked was there was no derogatory information associated with in this individual uh, prior to his travel to the United States or upon his arrival at our U.S. port of entry. Now, I'll tell you, we still have an investigation uh, into this individual. It is ongoing. Uh, but I can tell you that as we review this case, if we identify any gaps or deficiencies in our processes, we're going to work closely with our partners. So these are the partner countries. Uh, and obviously, internally, we're going to uh, do the review as well. We will address them and we will close those gaps. Okay, great. That's that's um, that's really helpful to understand the status of that. I want to ask one follow up sure. um, question on intelligence um, as it relates to the intelligence functions of the department in, in January sixth, uh, two thousand twenty one, and then I want and then we'll shift gears into talking to to more that relates to your role as COO of the department. So I want to I want to move to that. But but first, I have one follow up question on intelligence related issues and the January 6th attack on the Capitol, which uh, which is sort of a second terrorism related issue that I wanted to talk about today. Um, uh, you know, obviously, there's there's a congressional investigation going on with respect to January 6th in particular, but looking forward, so not looking back, but looking forward. Um, what from uh, you're in the secretary's perspective is DHS's role, whether it's intelligence, whether it's physical security, whether it's information sharing for preventing a future January 6th like event, which is domestic, uh, a domestic action. Great, thanks. Well, just uh, again, um, I'm glad that you said January, it's, it's amazing. It's been a year uh, and, you know, back on January 6th, 2021, I was like you, I was uh, a horrified citizen sitting in my home in Atlanta, watching this unfold across the various news networks. Uh, and now that I've been in the, the government back or back in government in DHS for about seven months now, and obviously as we've led our way up, you can see everything that's unfolding in terms of the various investigations uh, in Congress and certainly within the interagency, uh, we are taking, you know, we've been doing our reviews, plus, plus an anniversary, these year anniversaries oftentimes are opportunities, and we want to be that clear-eyed realist like we talked about before, we knew that there was a possibility. Uh, and one thing that we've seen, and I would say, you know, this is going back our, you know, uh, you know, throughout the entire year, right, over all of, almost all of 2021, and certainly into the uh, last few months leading up, one of the things that we all realize, I think at DHS, uh, and it was just reinforced even more across the interagency, across the federal law enforcement enterprise, is that intergovernment and interagency cooperation is so critical to being able to deal with these kinds of uh, threats. For DHS, right, we even, we've really improved uh, our information sharing. I mentioned it before with the federal, state, local, tribal, territorial, and private sector partners. I'm always going to be hammering that in uh, through what we believe to be uh, a timely and very detailed and appropriate dissemination of information on the threat environment. And you spoke about INA, you know uh, uh, better than most on this, on this, uh, in this form about our various INA advisories uh, on, on, th on the threat environment and the NTASs. And so that's something that, you know, can, if confirmed, uh, will be overseeing. And right now we've got a great acting undersecretary for uh, for intelligence analysis, John Cohen. And I know that you've spoken to him in, him in the past as well. Um, I know you didn't want to look too too much in the in the in the rear view, but I think it's you know let, let me just sort of pull in a couple of things that I wanted to speak to this. because uh, I think you know past is prologue in these things because I will tell you we're going to continue to do it. Uh, we've over the last year, and really it's more than the last several months versus the full year, We've, uh, we've had 50 engagements to inform our partners about the threat environment, to include 
bi-weekly calls with state and local law enforcement. And then we do look national calls with a really broad group of stakeholders. It is a really great way to share information across a, uh, a pretty uh, a diversified threat of uh, folks who are in the uh, law enforcement and in the communities who also have stakeholders who would be impacted. We, we get uh, on some of these calls, it can be about a dozen participants. In some of these calls, it's, it's 800 participants, right? We are getting the information out there and we're sharing. Now, one of the things we've talked about INA a, a few times here, one of the things that uh, INA has done, I think it was back in uh, May, so it was before I got here, but I read about it as soon as I came in and I've gotten to, to meet them. We, we actually established a new, a, a, dedic a new, but also a dedicated domestic terrorism branch to produce what we think is sound, timely intelligence to counter all of these different related threats. Uh, now, we are also looking at online activity. Uh, we both know that online activities where a lot of this, uh, the, the threat and the threat planning is, uh, and, and people speak about it, it's, uh, it's fo <laughs> the foment is pretty amazing. Uh, now we do it though, we're always ensuring that we're, and I said this before at the very beginning, uh, that that last clause, you know, to safeguard our values, that we're always uh, making sure that we are aligned with the civil rights and the liberties and the privacy and all applicable laws uh, when we do that. Um, I could talk again about CP3 here, but let me let me pause there and uh, turn it back to you. Yes, thanks so much. Thanks that um, very much for that for that response and explanation. I do want to shift gears. A little okay. bit. So let's talk about in. We, we've been focusing a little bit external. So external issues that the department addresses. Let's talk about inside the department. So sure. it was not lost on me, Mr. Deputy Secretary, that the very first issue at your confirmation hearing raised by Chairman Peters of the Senate Homeland Security Committee was morale mm. inside the Department of Homeland Security. Um, the data on this is not great. So there's uh, sort of the preeminent survey that's done of this is by um, our friends at the Partnership for Public Service. Their 2020 data ranked DHS as 17 out of 17 of the uh, department's uh, best places to work. So that's not so great. To be clear, this is a long-standing partner problem at the department. It is not uh, related to any particular administration. It has stimmied leadership of the department despite best efforts uh, across political administration. So this is a bipartisan problem um, at the department. You have told me that your primary uh, role as you have stepped into this new position at DHS is as the COO, the chief operating officer of the department. So morale fits right in there. Can you talk to us, talk to the CNES community that's watching today um, what are you and the secretary doing to improve morale at the Department of Homeland Security? Yeah, uh, no, I appreciate that question, uh, Carrie. And uh, we spoke about this, obviously, over the past uh, few weeks. And you, you're right, Chairman Peters asked me that question. In fact, I get asked this question quite a bit. And, and let me tell you, we are, and I've used this term before, I just want to tell you, you know, the Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security, I'm a cre uh, <laughs> pretty clear-eyed uh, realist. Three combat tours in Iraq, Iraq will do that for you. Uh, and I, I and we know, we absolutely know what the Fed scores say. Uh, I've, I've heard the 17 out of 17 know that that's true as well. But before, you know, I'm going to address that in a second. I'm going I'm to answer your question uh, head on. I do want to say, you know, for the 240,000 DHS employees who come to work every day, they come to work every day and they're not they will answer their surveys and everything obviously when it comes out but what they're focused on these 240,000 DHS employees the folks who I'm on the team with right and these are the thousands of of employees who interact with the thousands of American people our fellow citizens every day who swore the same oath of public service that you did at one time and that Ali and my orchestra and myself recently did they come and they are they are uh, to work. They are they bring their talents uh, to this to the mission that I spoke about before with honor and integrity. We will safeguard the American people, our homeland, and our values. And they do it twenty four hours a day because you know security, uh, so securing and safeguarding our country is a twenty four seven type of mission. And they do it as I said with honor and integrity. Okay, 
So um, because when, when people talk about morale, it's, you, you know, it's the, the first thing you think of are the, the workforce, the employees and the individuals. They are human beings and they're doing the job and they, they come and do it with honor and integrity every single day. Um, in terms of the morale piece, we are, we are the, the secretary said that as soon as I came in, he said, John, this is going to be one of your number one things that we, you and I are going to do. But as the chief operating officer, there are a lot of different things that you can do uh, to help improve uh, the morale here. And we're going to do, we're going to listen to Fed scores. But we, but we believe, Ali and I, Secretary Myrox and I believe that we also need to directly listen, literally listen, go meet. In fact, the secretary is on the southwest border for this entire week. He's flying back today from Yuma, uh, Del, Del Rio, and other parts of the south, southwest border, listening to the workforce. So we're, we're listening to our workforce. We're going to learn from our workforce. That's what good servant leaders do. That's what we both are, we believe, or at least aspire to. And we're going to be responsive to them. We're asking our, our question, our, ourselves the question, how can we deliver to them? It's, you, you, you were right to say it's a very, we've been talking a lot about external facing, which we should do. We're a department of partnerships. But as we look internally and we say, how can we deliver to the, to the DHS employee workforce? How can we deliver to them a department that they deserve, right? A department that they deserve. That is, we know that that's a fundamental first principle type of mission, and we're signed up for that. So here are some of the things that we're, we're doing. Well, the, the first thing is we're doing is we're saying, well, let's identify the gaps in the employee experience, uh, and that's based on their feedback. It's surveys, it's FEVs, it's other things, it's listening tours, uh, and let's identify practices that are working well. So let's reinforce those, right? You don't want to uh, sort of throw out what's working well and sort of redo it every single time. And as you noted, this has been a uh, concern over several administrations and over several years. We are hosting the listening sessions that I talked about before. These are, we go to the field, right? Literally travel out to the field, even during a global pandemic. And we, we talk to uh, employee focus groups. They know they're coming in uh, to have these discussions. It's a representative group. And what we're trying to figure out is what are the ground truths there? Uh, we're talking to senior leaders, obviously hear their perspectives and what's working, what's not. And then we're trying to leverage best practices across the department. Uh, we haven't spoken about that, the, the fact that there's, you know, these, these large component organizations uh, who have different challenges, but also different things that they're really doing well. So I can tell you this, we are absolutely committed to uh, really designing a new morale and employee, uh, employee engagement strategy. Uh, we're listening to our employees. And we will uh, invest in, in all of them, and we're going to invest in tackling this uh, this concern head on. So, Thanks one for follow, so a follow up to that is um, so part of uh, making the work that that the workforce is doing valued, and those who are giving a hundred percent know that they are appreciated for the hundred percent that they are giving. Part of that is making sure that uh, there is accountability. And that there is oversight for those who go out of the lines and um from time to time as you know and again this is over a, a period of time at the department there are issues of oversight and accountability um is there anything that you can speak to that is going on at the leadership level that you guys are looking at in terms of the department to make sure that in addition to the listening and the support giving that there is a comparable uh, mechanisms being put in place on the oversight and accountability front. Yeah, one of the things as, as a chief operating officer, so one is chief operating officer and also deputy secretary. I'm a 2IC, right? So second in charge, that's what we call them in the Army. Uh, and it's uh, it's a real honor, pleasure to support uh, Ali Mayorkas in that. I will tell you also a quick aside to that. Uh, you know as well as I do, Ali uh, held the same job I did, right, as a deputy secretary. So sometimes that can be, it's like, oh, okay, all right, uh, you know, the boss sort of knows exactly where you're at. The great news for me is, uh, you know, Ali passed on what I think is to be a really informed playbook to me. And he said, okay, look, these are the things I learned as a deputy secretary and also as a as component head, as the director for USCIS. And he said, Here, here's the things that I think uh, you can and should focus on, right? So it's great to have really good, clear direction even from your boss, even better that it's informed by 
his essentially eight years in uh, during the Obama administration in DHS. So, you know, part of that, uh, it's actually, we, we call it, uh, it's a series of priorities. I know we don't, I'm looking at my clock. I know I have a lot of time left. It's, we actually call it the Secretary's Infrastructure Transformation Priorities. Uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of them and they, part of that is the oversight, but we really bucket them into three big uh, sort of categories, workforce, things like recruitment, hiring, training, morale, uh, making sure that we're doing everything we can to ensure DEI is woven through all that we do, stewardship, which are, and that's exactly where you're at, budgeting, financial management, uh, due diligent oversight, and operations, improving our operations. We're a very operational department, you know that, uh, and we are focused on, you know, how do we make things more efficient, more effective? Uh, we're trying to, we're thinking about some uh, new ways as we look at our institution, our organizational alignment. I spoke about best practices before across the components, right? So we've got all those leveraged opportunities, but also really across uh, the federal government uh, and elsewhere. We'll take the best practices wherever they make the most sense. Um, things like the reserve, uh, uh, the possibility of improving uh, our reserve workforce because the things will continue to come at us. I think we're, you know, I was hoping to talk to you a little bit about Operation Allies Welcome. Maybe I'll just, I've got the mic for a second. Let me tell you, uh, for someone who was the senior director for Afghanistan and Pakistan in the uh, first term of the Obama administration, uh, it was it was really you know great to be able to be part of what I call not just a whole of government but a whole of society mission uh, that allowed us to make sure that we we took on what we believe to be the moral imperative to help these now up to eighty four thousand Afghan evacuees. Uh, come into the United States after they were fully screened, fully vetted, gone through the whole security suite to make sure uh, that you know we were okay with them coming into the country and get them onto uh, you know these Department of Defense safe havens uh, and then onto communities. And we started with eighty four thousand. We're down to about eight thousand. We started with eight safe havens across a bunch of different military bases, mm -hmm. and, and now we're down to three. And we should be down to just one uh next month really proud of the interagency really proud of the ngos who helped us out uh certainly department of defense state uh hhs uh and of course dhs who many many probably don't know it but we were uh, we were chosen to be the lead federal agency uh and a great guy bob fenton uh who's one of our senior fema officials uh led the oaw mission I'm not just talking about OAW. What I'm really talking about is I think it's representative of what it meant in the Biden administration to build back better. I, I think I don't think we could have done it uh, had we not had the great uh, contributions and um, dedicated uh, professionalism from across the interagency. And as I said, whole of society. We're counting on uh, those American communities out there that are bringing in these Afghan evacuees to be really part of the new national fabric for their their. their local community fabric for their communities uh, man i'm really sorry carrie i i know we're almost out of time but thanks for letting me talk about oaw and talk about my great colleagues here in dhs that that's that's great and i'm going to use that to help frame um what's going to be my final question and then i know we're we're going a couple minutes over but i'm going to ask for your indulgence for sure. for just sure. another minute or so um because our time has gone really really fast so i'm going to try to weave together a few things for this final question okay. and then we'll close um, so Operation Allies Welcome um, is an example of the department responding to a particular crisis, a particular mm -hmm. event, a world event that then the department is tasked with handling. What I want to ask you about is how then are you and the secretary thinking about the overall priority? So I have one question I want to recognize from my friend and colleague at CNN, Geneva Sands, who typed in with a question regarding whether you're worried about cyber threats um, as a result of to critical infrastructure related to what is going on in Ukraine and the diplomatic conversations and the potential for actions um, in Ukraine. What I, and I know for our wonky policy oriented audience, they are interested in the fact that D the department is currently working on its strategic planning, its quadrennial Homeland Security Review, which is being done again this year and will be forthcoming in 2022. So the question that I want to ask you to close, Mr. Deputy, is in light of the crisis-driven activities that the department is consistently pulled into, 
how, and you and the secretary, how are you thinking about strategic planning, big picture priorities for the department going forward? When you're faced with resettling Afghan uh, refugees, when you're faced with potential uh, threats to critical infrastructure, how are you then able to step back and think about strategically, where do we want this department to be going? No, thanks. And I, I stole a look over here to the uh, chat section. I sort of saw that coming up. So let me uh, quickly address the uh, cybersecurity question that was asked over there. Uh, we, I'd actually point you to a recent advisory that uh, it was last week. Uh, actually, it was on Monday. It was uh, five days ago that, and we spoke about the DHS uh, intelligence analysis shop up there. Uh, we, we issued an advisory around the uh, the threat concerns that we have possibly uh, emanating as a result of uh, the Russia-Ukraine uh, situation. And so we've got it. Uh, my good friend uh, uh, and the head of CISA, Jen Easterly, uh, also a West Point graduate, also a combat, uh, uh, a combat uh, veteran from in the United States Army, as uh, the head of it. And uh, CISA, along with the rest of the DHS cybersecurity enterprise, uh, know full well what uh, the possible threats are there. Uh, we are doing the things I've talked about before. We are doing the information sharing. We're also doing the partnerships that we spoke about, and in particular into the private sector uh, who own the vast majority of our critical infrastructure across the United States of America. So we've got it. We're clear-eyed realist on that. Uh, and there are a lot of actions that are being taken to make sure that we're doing all that we can uh, across uh, the United States in response to the cybersecurity threats. And no matter what the, where the threats are coming from, whether it's nation states or, or non-nation state actors. On to uh, the, the, you talked about- The, the big quadru- picture. Yeah, the Quadrennial Homeland Security Review, the QHSR. And, uh, and just strategic planning, how you're thinking about, you know, how in these crisis, the crisis to crisis or, you know, particular things that, that take your attention, how then are you guys thinking about the strategic plan, the big picture priorities. Right. So, on the big, so from a from a prog- programmatic, you have to have these four year plans, right? So, their uh, QHSR was done uh, twice during the Obama administration, not during the last administration. So, really, we're doing a QHSR that's focused uh, over the next uh, from FY twenty two to twenty six, and we realize it, it's we realize exactly what you said at the beginning. There were so many different threats and they've evolved right over certainly over the last 20 years i know you write a lot on the fact that okay are we uh are we in a different threat environment that requires different kinds of strategic planning we fully appreciate that Uh, and we are part of this part of one of the things that we're doing and actually falls a lot in terms of what i do in terms of the coo but it's connected obviously to all the component leadership and certainly how Secretary Mayorkas uh, is leading this department, is to say there are going to be more, and we don't we don't look at OAW as a crisis. We looked at it as a moral imperative uh, to support these Afghan allies who were with us for, for almost 20 years uh, during the you know Afghanistan war. And so we said, hey, that's a moral imperative. Uh, but nonetheless, it wasn't something we were planning for, um, you know, uh, in terms of the, especially at 84,000 over a few months of trying to uh, resettle them and, and make them part of the fabric of their local community. So we know there's going to be more things like that. And certainly this has happened in DHS before. So we're being clear eyed realists around that. We are structuring ourselves to be prepared for when that happens again. Uh, so number one. And number two, one, one thing uh, you didn't say, but I'll, I'll put it in there. You got to connect these uh, strategic documents uh, so that they don't end up necessarily, I could pull a couple of glossies here from the left and right of my desk uh, up onto a shelf. And so one thing we're doing is connecting it to our resource planning guidance, which is a, bu- a budget document, because at the end of the day, that's what drives your ability uh, to, because uh, at the end of the day, strategy is ends, ways, and means. So that's, that's how we think about it here. You have to make sure that if you start with the strategy, that there's a way that you can implement it and that you've got the means, oftentimes, uh, money, but also people uh, that you can apply it in the most optimized and prioritized fashion. So, um, at any rate, thanks again. I appreciate the question, uh, Geneva. All right, appreciate that. I appreciate your uh, your comments on the strategic planning going forward. We are out of time, Mr. Deputy Secretary. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, especially for this launch of the Safe at Home series, for sharing your priorities, for sharing your insights in your new role, and most importantly, for answering 
the call to serve once again. Uh, we are really grateful. And thanks to everyone who watched this conversation. You can share comments about today's conversation on Twitter at our hashtag CNAS 2022. I look forward to seeing you again for our next conversation and how the government can do better to make all Americans safe at home. Thank you, Karen.